I'm Pastor Josh. And I'm Pastor Tara. We want to welcome you to our YouTube page and we pray that today you are blessed by everything you experience. And if you are blessed by this sermon, please don't forget to share it with someone in your world. Let's go live to the message. You know, we get into trouble in life when we make things about ourselves. Most of our lives, we approach God on the basis of what we need, don't we? And there's, in, in one sense, there's nothing wrong with that. So if you're sick as an example, like I, I had a heart attack in January. I know it's hard to imagine, I did. Like a very minor one, but it was a heart attack nevertheless. And when I was in hospital, like what, what do you think I'm asking the Lord for? Revelation on the book of Exodus? No. Lord, heal me. You get that? Lord, I, right now, I don't understand, but I need healing. So heal me, Lord. You might be in lack this morning. So what do we do? We say, Lord, will you, are you my provider? Will you provide for me? Isn't that right? Lord, I'm lonely. Can you? Whatever it is, oftentimes what we do is we approach God on the basis of what's going on in our lives. But when Jesus came, he came to give us the greatest revelation. All right? At, at this point in time, you might think that the greatest revelation of God that you need is healer. It's, now, if you need healing in your body, the Lord, I, I believe, is here. And even as the word comes out, as I speak the word, you can receive healing in your seat. Do you know that? Amen. 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 Why? Because his words are life to us. They're life to our bones. But the greatest revelation that Jesus brought is not healer or not provider. It's father. And in fact, once everything that you need is in the revelation of father. Now, I've got three kids, two girls, uh, 11 and 13, and they read a lot of books. And because uh, their mom <laughs> encourages them, not because of me. And, uh, so, but they call me father. It's really annoying, right? It's like Enid Blyton books. She's got a lot to answer for, that lady. So like when we're in shops and stuff, my, my middle one would go, father, can we? And it's like, and you can see people looking at me like, what is going on in that family? And I go, call me daddy. And the little one, father. And I'm like, oh, they think it's hilarious. I just feel embarrassed because it feels cold. Doesn't it? It feels kind of remote. But it wasn't Father. We know it was Abba. It was Dad. You know, I anticipate all my kids' needs. They don't get to a Thursday in the week, and I look at them and go, what, you want fed again? What do you mean you want me to feed you? I fed you every day this week. You want? Like, seriously, kids, wise up. You're just, you're taking advantage now, quite frankly, <laughs> of mother and father's goodness. You don't want that. To you. That's not that the Lord goes in front. And I anticipate every need that my children have. And I'm massively imperfect. But I want to read a story to you today. It's a well-known story. And the problem is with the story, what we've done is we've started with ourselves in it because it's always been taught that way. But this is one of the greatest stories of grace and one of the greatest revelations of dad in the whole Bible. And it's called the parable of parables. It's the prodigal. And what's interesting, as soon as I say prodigal, most of you have heard the story 10,000 times. And I would probably hazard a guess that most of those times you've heard it the wrong way around. Because actually, Jesus never uses the term prodigal. You can read that story from one end to the other, and it's not a term that he used. Because he never starts with us. It's amazing. You know, in your life, what happens is we start with where we're at and what we need and everything else. But the Lord has a different grid. And what he wants to do to reveal in our lives is not where we are and what we need to do, but it's who he is. Because Jesus said, if, you, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So it's, a, it's a, a picture, if you like, of the incredible grace of God. Are you ready to receive it this morning? Okay, brilliant. And now I'm gonna assume for the purposes of time that most of you know the story well. And so I'm not gonna read it all, but there is a, there, there's some, just some great truths that I wanna unpack for you very quickly. Okay, so where do we start? If you, if you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15, I will pull out some verses. So what we do in our lives is we start with us. Lord, here's where I am. This is what it looks like. This is what I'm doing. This is what I need. And Jesus, at the, Jesus never misses a word or never does something by accident. Things in the word are never written just because they didn't know another way to write them. Everything has a purpose and everything has a meaning. And so where does Jesus start? He doesn't start with you. Right? And so therefore what we know when we come to interpret the Bible is where Jesus puts the emphasis, that's where he wants your attention to be. So he could have started this story with, this son was an absolute nightmare, but where does he start? He starts with, there was a man. And so at the very start of the story, he's, he's making it clear, this is not about the, what else is just about to come, about the, the, the son, the prodigal. This is about a man who had a son. And so the emphasis at the start for us is to look and see what was this man doing? 
a picture of the Father. It also comes after a number of other parables that talk about the Father and how he goes and searches for things that are precious and of value. And so his starting point is not you. Now, th this is a revelation that will change your life. Whenever you start with you and you're focused on you, you will always end up in trouble. But when you have a revelation, an increasing and growing revelation of Jesus and his finished work for you, then you're able to receive everything that Abba has. Amen? And so what happens in, in the middle of this story, there is, a, there is a revelation of grace that we see that I want to explain to you. I just want to set one thing in context as well. All of this happens that the relationship is father-son. So I'm speaking to people this morning who are in Christ, right? I'm also speaking to people who don't know Jesus this morning, but one of the greatest uh, ways that the enemy keeps the church locked in a cycle of not just defeat, but a cycle of never believing that there's more than what I have is through what is called condemnation. The word condemnation in the Bible is, is a, it's called katakrima. That's the original word. And what it means is it's what I do is one thing, but because of what I did, there is a price that needs to be paid and a punishment that is due, okay? So we live with a conscious mindset of because of my shortcomings, there is a, pay, a price that needs to be paid for it. And condemnation is that cycle of going, who's gonna pay? I am gonna have to pay because I did something wrong. So it's not just what you did, it's what results. What is the result of what you did? And many of us have this view that I start with myself, what I'm doing, what I'm not doing, what I'm doing well, what I'm not doing well. And Jesus says, get your head up this morning and look at this man, Father. Are we ready to go? Perfect. Okay, so let's look at verse, verse 20 because it's amazing. It's amazing. And you know, you guys are, you know, you're, you're taught so well in this church, aren't you? I mean, you've got amazing Pastor Alan, Pastor Josh, you know, Suzanne, Pastor Sam, you, you know, incredible teachers of the word. So we know what five is in the, in the Bible, don't we? It's the number of grace. And so what we do, let's look at verse 20. Because at this point in the story, the young boy has basically messed it up. He's gone, he's while living, he's basically told his dad, I want you dead. That's the, the subtext of give me my inheritance early. We understand that. But remember, it's not about the wild boy. It's about the father who's watching. So let's read verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. This is the young boy coming to, to his senses. And, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion, ran, embraced, and kissed him. Let's read that again. Because what we start to see is how Jesus is dealing with you this morning. There's five things. It is a picture of what grace looks like. He sees you, he has compassion, he runs, he embraces, and he kisses. Let's unpack that. While he, remember, there's not one word wasted. While he was a great way off. You know what I love about this? I, I, I love the fact that, that Jesus puts this in to, to make a point. Because it's not that many of us, there'll be people here this morning and the legalist in us will go, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not perfect, but I'm not as bad as him, right? point in whatever direction you want, but be careful. That's what I'm saying. Definitely not as bad as him, right? And, uh, but it's, it's not that many of us, some, some of you might be far away today, whatever that means. I don't even know what that means. Really? The point is not that are we far away, it's that many of us never feel like we're close enough. Isn't that the truth? I always could be doing better. And what Jesus says at the very start of this here was, while you were a great way off, the father was looking and scanning. Now, in those days, people lived in community and rich people would have lived in the village as well. And what would have happened every day is day and night, they would have seen this man looking for their son. And they would have said to themselves, the boy's a devil, let him run. Don't let him back. But even when he's a long way off, the father is looking. I want to say to you today, you have never for one minute of your life, and right now, I don't care what you're doing, where you are, or how bad you think it is. Your father never takes his eyes off you. Do you hear me? Never. See, what happens is this. When we do something wrong, we feel guilty. Guilt is as a result of what I do. When we don't have our guilt dealt with, it leads to shame. Shame is not what I do, but who I think I am. It's a step further down the line. The Greek word for shame is entrope, entropy in English. And what that means is that we turn in on ourselves. 
we turn in and we can't, we don't want to see anyone. Do you know like with kids, like when my kids were, were, not, were naughty, when my kids are naughty, right? And they do stuff, they turn, they won't look at you. Isn't that right? Because they feel shame, they feel guilt. And what happens is entropy makes us turn away, it puts our attention on ourselves. But actually in Matthew 6, 6 in the message version, it says, don't role play before God as much as you can simply sit before him, right? And what you'll find is as, as your attention shifts, it says in Matthew 6, off yourself and onto God, you'll feel a sense of his grace filling you. So the key is get, the, get your eyes off yourself and onto the father who loves you and grace will start to flow. I wanna tell you today, like I, I genuinely, genuinely wanna say to you, that he's never taken his eyes off you for a minute. You know what, do you know what I find with my kids? I absolutely love my kids, like I really do. And I know we all think our geese are swans as we would say in Belfast, right? But sometimes I find myself just staring at, at the girls and I, I get emotional, honestly, it's not, you might think, wise up, but I do. I just sit and I look at them and I feel it like, oh my goodness, you know? There's moments where they drive me crazy, right? because they're not perfect, but I can't take my eyes off them at times, just watching, right? Just like, I love it. When they were babies, we used to call it baby TV. Just used to sit and gaze at them. What did they do? Nothing. I just loved looking at them. And what's interesting in this bit of the story is, you know, some people think that God has, you think that God, actually the Lord's forgotten you, that he's looking at other people. He's got his eyes on them, but not on you because of whatever reason. He loves others, other people, but you're out of sight, but you're not. He sees you. Can I say this? He sees you. Never does anything other than be 100% aware of everything that is going on with you. He never forgets. He doesn't take his eyes off for a minute. He never rests in his care for you. And you think, oh, that's not good because if you knew, Pastor, what I was up to, right? I don't want you to see me. But look what happens next. When he sees, what is it, with eyes of judgment? Is he angry and disappointed? Is he waiting to punish you? Not one bit. Can I just tell you this morning, if you're in Christ this morning, the Lord will never punish you again. Did you hear me? Some of you don't believe that. Some of you think, now careful now, pastor. There's a, Martin Lloyd-Jones said many years ago, if your preaching of the gospel of grace does not acute, lead to an accusation of antinomianism, which is heresy or lawlessness, then you haven't actually preached the gospel of grace. I wanna tell you this morning, the gospel of the finished work of Jesus is so ridiculously scandalous that it should arrest you in your seat this morning to go, oh my God, how he loves me. Because when he looks at you, what we see next is he has compassion. He doesn't have judgment, why? Because he judged Jesus for you. He punished Jesus for you. So his only response, this word splagizomai in, in the Greek, it's a cracking word, isn't it? Sounds like you're going to splagizomai all over you, right? But it's a gut visceral love. It's where we go, it's not that God loves, but he is love in his very essence, in his very being. When he looks, the result is compassion, not a fleeting whim, but to his very core, he was moved. He moved towards you. And his response from the deepest place is not bitter, or anger, right? It was just deep care and concern for you. Isn't that amazing? So whenever you think about the Lord looking into your life this morning and Grace looking into your life, he's not angry. He's not disappointed. He's not saying like every school report that I ever had was nice kid, but could try harder. Do you know what I mean? Anybody give me an amen on that? Yeah, I was, well, I was called once in school, a toity loiterer on the path of knowledge. <laughs> I thought that was a compliment. I was like, that's brilliant. Look at that, toity loiterer. Until my mother pointed out that that was not a good thing, all right? I was like, oh, the irony of it all. But I want to tell you this morning that the Lord is deeply compassionate and his compassion moves him. Some of us don't believe that. Some of us believe that, look, no, Lord, it can't be true because you see, you see what nobody else sees. So how could you love me? And he says, I've got nothing else other than love for you. Am I a God of anger? And a God of... Listen, the wrath of God was satisfied in the cross of Christ. It's outrageous. But what about when I do? It doesn't matter. 
As far as the east is from the west, I've removed, he says. Do you know why it doesn't say north and south? Because east and west don't meet. Now you could say latitude, we can talk about that. But the points are around the center of the globe, they don't meet. So east is always going west and west is always going east and the two never meet. That's why the Bible says east from west. Okay. I want to tell you this morning, the Lord's deeply, deeply, deeply in love with you. He doesn't count your mess. It's not that he is afraid of your mess. He can't look at it. He looks at you every day. And no matter where you are, it's just visceral, deep compassion for you. Do you know why that is? Romans 2, 4 tells us. You will never change or be transformed from one level of grace to another through self-effort, works, performance, or trying harder. Romans 2, 4 tells us never give up on the goodness of God. Why? It's the only thing that leads to repentance. Repentance being change. You know, the Lord will love you into the person that he's called you to be. He will transform you by loving you. You know why, do you know why we don't change at times? Because if we feel like the Lord is gonna punish us, if you feel like you're gonna be punished, like with my kids, did you hit your sister? No. Sister's eye is out here. What happened? I don't know. Now my wife is a genius. She, because with dad, I would go, of course you hit your sister. Look at the state of her. I didn't hit her. She fell, right? And then Penny would come along, St. Penny as I call her. She would come along and say, was it a little accident? Yes, mommy, it was an accident. I hit her by accident. I'm like, that's genius. But what was it? She removed the threat of punishment in a moment. So what was there could come out. Do you get that? If you feel like you're gonna be threatened or punished, okay, you will never open yourself up to be transformed by grace. That's why it's so important to know that you will never be punished by the Lord. Why? So in a place of grace, what is in there can come out and be dealt with by the Lord. Amen. He has compassion on you. What does that compassion do? The number three thing. It says here that he runs, right? The son hasn't repented yet. This is amazing. So what happens is the son's not repented. It's not like, you know, like he's, he, we think, well, the, the son got it together. He didn't. The son was as selfish the whole way through the story as he was at the beginning. Let me say that again. He doesn't repent and say, oh, I've done wrong. He goes, I'm hungry and my, my father's servants get better than what I get. I'll go back and I'll, I'll make myself a servant. Isn't that crazy? That's why this story's not about him and his mess. It's about the unbelievable love of the father for you. Let me tell you what happens. As he sees and he has compassion, what it does is we think that sin repels the goodness of God. We feel it's like kryptonite to Superman. When I mess up, what does the Lord do? Well, he turns. He turns away. He might love me, but he can't look at my mess. Actually, what happens is the Lord starts to run. And you know the story, right? He picks up. It's about a lack of dignity. And... Um, I'll give you the word, it's actually trek, so it means to run wide open. It's to advance speedily like an athlete moving towards with full effort and directed purpose. And it conveys an intense desire to get to the goal as quickly as possible. It was completely undignified. But let me tell you this, whatever your mess is this morning, whatever's going on, known or unknown, it will never repel the goodness and the grace of God towards your life, never. <laughs> never, don't turn in on yourself, but turn to the one who loves you. Because the undignified bit of this was not just like, it was, a, it was a picture of the cross, the same word used here to describe Jesus on the cross as he stripped naked and beaten to a pulp and crucified on our behalf. He lost all dignity. And the sense is Jesus had already told us what it would be like, how the Lord would empty himself of all dignity. The God of, can you imagine? The God of heaven and all the universe emptied himself of all dignity for you. It's scandalous, isn't it? Like, I can't begin to describe how much he loves you. I'm doing such a bad job of it this morning, but if you can get just a little bit of the depth of his love for you, you will be changed forever because he took no dignity, no place. He ran towards you. Let me tell you something. I love the way Pastor Prince puts it. He says, when unclean things touch the clean, it is not the clean that becomes unclean, right? But it's the unclean that becomes clean. His love and his grace is way bigger than your mess this morning. Somebody give me an amen in this house this morning. Do not let the devil hold you up for one minute saying, it's too much, it's too big, the Lord doesn't like the Lord. He all, his only way of directing and traveling is towards you every day. Do you know, I, I grew up in a, I've been, 
I've been married for 26 years. Ooh. Okay, well, thank you very much. Got married when I was 10, and just if you're, <laughs> we do that now, and just if you're trying to age me, you know, it's hard to believe. Married, maybe 11, 10 or 11, and, uh, <laughs> and, and Penn and I, who, um, like, we, we grew up in a church where it was a great church, but we, we grew up thinking, like, I, I have really, really got, like, every day, Lord, would you bless me? Like, I had to remind the Lord every day, like, because he's forgetful, apparently. <laughs> Lord, I really need this. I need you to do this. Lord, would you rend the heavens and come down for me? You know, I, um, I got saved in a really traditional church. My primary school teacher used to drive us there in an old school bus, which would never pass anything to do with health and safety in any country in the world. So the fumes used to come into the bus, right? So you'd have like 40 kids gassed off their face by the time they got to the meeting. It could have been a strategy, I don't know, but I was like literally <laughs> high as a kite every Wednesday as a seven-year-old going to the meeting because, <laughs> and there was my, my teacher wearing a beret and a, a dress driving the bus. God bless her, I loved that woman. But we would get put into, into rows and uh, quite sinister, everyone in the meeting was called uncle. Don't know why, because they weren't my uncle, but it used to cause me great confusion. But Uncle Eddie used to give us the gospel every week. And I bless this man, he was so sincere. But Uncle Eddie had one massive eye and one little eye. And he had a puppet who had a massive eye and a little eye, right? <laughs> I don't know which one came first, but they kind of looked the same. And he wore a brown crimpoline suit, right? And Uncle Eddie could spit like a donkey. So if you were in the first 25 rows of the children's meeting, <laughs> You were covered in Uncle Eddie spit every, honestly, right? So of course you got saved, because if you got saved, you could move out of the way. So Uncle Eddie wasn't covering you in spit. And he, he used the, I don't know if you ever had them in South Africa. Remember Fuzzy Felt? Fuzzy Felt on the boards? Well, he had the hell edition, right? And so it was just people dropping off cliffs into the fiery furnace. So I could feel the flames lapping around my knees every Wednesday as I got saved. And I would go home and say, Lord, oh, Forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Because I had Uncle Eddie, what would happen? Or the puppet, rather? Or was it Uncle Eddie? I don't know. What would happen if the Lord came back tonight, Andrew? What would he think? Like, I was eight years old. But you know what? I would say, God, forgive me. God, forgive me. God, forgive me. God, forgive me. Don't go away from me, Lord. Don't, you know, I'd read the Psalms and like, please don't forsake me, da-da-da. Then I grew up through church and it would be, Lord, would you come down? It's like, almost like there's a tipping point in heaven. Some of you believe that, you do. There's a tipping point. You haven't prayed enough. You haven't given enough yet. You haven't done enough yet. And God is waiting there looking at your situation apparently, just going, ah, says to Peter, just give them another few minutes. Let's see if they can tip the scales in their favor. It's nonsense. He runs towards you every day. He loved you first church. And because he has compassion for you, he runs towards you. And then he embraces you, number four. What I love about this is this kid would have been stinking with mess. Pig muck, right? We know the significance of pigs to, to the Jewish people. But just imagine pig mess through his hair. They didn't shower every morning under his fingernails. I mean, you would have smelt him as he walked in through the door here, right? You'd have been going, what on earth is that? And there he would have been in all of his mess, all of his stinkingness, gr literally ground into the very cracks in his hands, his whole body from top to bottom. And what does compassion do? Well, compassion runs towards, and then it says here that the word is that as he runs, he fell upon his neck, is the actual word for embrace, right? So he falls on him and he literally takes him up in his arms, mess and all, and just holds him in that moment. Can I tell you something? See, in your mess, in your moment of worse, like whatever it is you do, or whatever it is you think you do, I don't know, but in that moment, I want you to stop feeling condemned and turn and say, Lord, thank you that right now you're embracing me. He's not put off by your mess. He's not put off by the stink of it. He's not put off by the smell of it. He's not put off by what the world says about it because actually the pig stuff was just about signaling to the Jewish culture. Like this is a cultural thing as well. It doesn't matter. I love the fact that in my worst moments, right? 
Grace says, in my worst moments, grace abounds even more. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Because it's not in your worst moments that he turns from you. This is the revelation of father, of dad. He look, he's right there and he just folds on your neck and then he starts to kiss. Man, the Italians like to kiss you. Be careful of whoever that is at the back. <laughs> Let me just tell you. Because given half a chance, they'll kiss you and keep kissing you. And as an Irish man, that's really awkward. Like we just don't do that, all right? I only kiss my wife once a week, whether I need to or not. You know what I mean? That's a joke. I was telling the first service, like we, we say in Ireland, you know the story of the Irish man who gets married and on his 50th wedding anniversary, his wife turns to him and says, do you love me? He goes, don't be stupid, of course. He says, why are you asking me that question? And she says, well, you never tell me. He says, listen, I told you on the day that I married you, and if I ever changed my mind, I'll let you know, all right? <laughs> That's romance Irish style. That's the way we do it. <laughs> yes, come on. But the Italians, they love it. I remember like, when they approached me last week, the first thing they want to do is like, I was like, get off, what are you doing? <laughs> like, it's really, when men want to do that as well, like I don't mind, some Italian women, I was like, no problem. You know, kiss, 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 <laughs> right? But when some big burly Italian man who's six foot four and has a beard down to here is kind of thinking, yeah, it's a different story. So we kind of think it's, well, well, it's not. He kisses and kisses and kisses and kisses as he does this. You know, it's, um, it's like the, the sense actually in the tense of the language here is again and again and again and again and again and again and again. He can't stop kissing him. The son is covered in mess. The son is stinking, all right? Like what the father understands though is that his poison is gonna be loved out of him. He'll find wholeness, strength, and security as he continually feels the kiss of approval from his father. That's the way he loves you this morning, church. That's the way he loves you. That is the revelation that Jesus, he's, he's not trying to give us a revelation of how bad we can be and how rebellious we can be. He's saying there was a man who sees, has compassion, runs, embraces, and kisses. Even in your mess, amen. But that's just not it. There was no, do you know what's interesting here? There's no probation time. Let, let's look at a couple of verses. Okay, because there, there's something here which blows my mind every time. You know, what the father did here was even more incredible. You know, when the son was away, we think, oh, he just came to his senses. And it actually says he came to his senses. He came to his senses because he was hungry. He was just selfish to the core. This gives me hope because at times, do you, do you ever wonder why you do things at times? Oh, I've, <laughs> I'm going to say I feel like a a lion and a den of Daniels here, not, not the other way around. No pastor, we never do anything other than like we're so holy here, right? Well, I do stuff and I, I sometimes wonder, flip me, where did that come from? Anybody? Okay, good. <laughs> that was starting to get really awkward there for a moment. <laughs> but uh, what I love about this, right, is that the son goes, I just wanna be a servant. And so he rehearses his speech in his head and he goes, I'll just go back to my dad, my father, and I'll go, you know what? And he rehearses it in his head. Watch what the father does, because this just blows my mind. Verse 21, then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Now remember in the bit before this, he then goes to make me one of your hard servants. Verse 22, right? But the father said to his servants, quick, Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Isn't it amazing? At the point where the boy is gonna say, I tell you what, Lord, I've messed it up, but you know what I'll do? I'll prove myself to you. I'll not do it again. I'll earn your good grace. Just give me the minimum, right? He had minimum thinking and he said, if I could just be a servant, so that would be great. Do you know what's interesting? The father doesn't even let him get that out. He stops him dead. Do you know why? Because the story is this. The Lord will never let you earn through your own performance or through your own effort that which he's already provided by his grace. He just won't allow it. There is no room for your effort in the grace of God. It is one or the other. He says, if you're going to work, I'm going to rest. But why don't you rest in this revelation of Father and let me go to work for you? Amen. I love it. And so it's like, at this point, 
I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Ah, ah, stop. And what does he say? Quick, bring out the robe. I love this. Let me just explain it very quickly to you. Why these three things? Well, in that culture, bring out the best robe. Well, in that culture, rich families would have had a best robe. And it was only reserved for visiting dignitaries or VIPs. And what happened, it, was co- it covered the guest completely. Now, the robe was not theirs. It was given to them as a gift. And it was given to them to do something, one, one big um, point to giving it to them. It was to show them their place, right? You couldn't earn it. It had to be given to you by the head of the home. Isn't that amazing? What does Isaiah 61, 10 says? I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with what? Garments of salvation and arrayed me in what? A robe of righteousness. Isn't it incredible? So at the point where you come to the Lord and you go, I'll not do it again. I'll try my best. Just, if you would just come through for me. He says, stop. I have given you the robe of righteousness. Do you know what that means? Righteousness is diakasune. It means your condition is totally acceptable to God. Isn't it amazing? Your condition right now in this moment in Christ is as perfect and acceptable to the Lord as it will be for all of eternity. He has arrayed you with righteousness. And you know what's interesting in those robes? What they did was they filled the robes with everything that the guest would need for their stay. So in righteousness, in this position where you're acceptable to God, and the Father says, no, no, quick. Do you know that whole thing of quick? Why quick? It's like, let's not have in our lives times where we're trying to earn what is given to us in grace. Quickly get back to righteousness, right? And in that place, put your hands deep into righteousness, and you will find all the healing that you need in there, all the provision that you need. It's all supplied in righteousness. Amen. He then says this, oh, I've only got a few minutes. Okay. He then says, put a ring on his hand. This is going to minister to somebody today. Uh, like I said, a, a ring is a symbol of value. So Penny gave me this ring 26 years ago. Okay. It's a symbol of our love and commitment to each other. But in Bible days, it was different. It was kind of like a MasterCard and like a Visa card. Okay. Wealthy people had rings. Like in Ben-Hur, I love the, the Ben-Hur movie, when... He saves the Roman general and the Roman general gives him his ring. Now, why did he do that? It was about carrying authority. Now, this is outrageous. Scandalous grace, okay? Because this wee fella had messed it up, hadn't he? Right? He had made a mess. He had taken money. He had squandered it. He had wanted his father dead, right? He had blown the family uh, resources, all of this kind of stuff. And as quick as a moment, like, I don't know about you and I, do you know what you and I think? Where we've messed it up in the past, we will never be able to stand again in full confidence of faith that God can use us in that very area. Some of us in our relationships go, I made a mess of them in the past. How could I ever, like, would God ever trust me? There's a price to be paid. I made a mistake. I can't believe for fullness and favor. Why? How? How could I possibly believe for that? And what happens is as the ring is put on his finger, it carried the full authority of the son to conduct business on his father's behalf. Isn't that crazy? You wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Would you trust somebody who had made a complete mess of it, who's standing there still selfish? But do you know what the point is? What is Jesus trying to say? He's trying to say, my grace is bigger than your mess. You will never make a bigger mess than my grace can't get you out of. Do you know that? You can mess it up to this far, but where there is sin, my grace super abounds, he says. He says, stop thinking that I am limited in my resource and in my favor for you. It's incredible. He puts, and he says, you can conduct authority. You can conduct business on my behalf in the very area where you messed it up. Somebody say amen this morning. Because some of you have sat here this morning going, I cannot believe that God, you'll use me again in this area. I will always walk with a limp because of what happened in the past. And the Lord says, in a moment, quick, put on righteousness. And then the the ring actually is about the name of Jesus, where how we conduct You have been given the authority of the name of Jesus to direct and speak blessing and favor into your life and into the life of others. Amen. It's outrageous. And what if I mess it up again? The Lord says, well, I'll dress you in righteousness again. Put the ring on your finger and say, go again. Why? Because my grace is bigger than your mess. 
That is favor and it offends the legalist in us. The last thing is he puts sandals on the boy's feet. Why is that? In, in, when you read uh, John 15, vine, branches, all that stuff, uh, you see that how the Lord lifts us up off the dirt. You see it actually in the tabernacle as well, how they would put silver redemption on the bottom of the footpost to lift it up out of the dirt. So we stand not in the earth, but we stand on redemptive ground. Okay, uh, the, the, the pictures go the whole way through. But what's interesting here, there's two words in the New Testament for sandals. There's the cheap ones, okay, which I say like the ones you buy your kids for the beach, right? And there, that's, who, that's uh, sandal on is the word. It, Jesus doesn't use the word sandal on. It's nothing cheap here. He's gonna lift the boy up off the ground, up off the dirt, and he's gonna place his feet on different ground. So Jesus uses the word hupedema, which was a luxury leather sandal. They were luxury leather items. And the father brings out those and says, put on the very, let this kid stand on the very best ground again. Oh man, this just blows my head. Like seriously, Lord, it can't be that good. Some of you are listening to me going, it can't be that good. Careful now, let's have a wee bit of balance. Let me tell you something. The grace of God is scandalous. It should sit you back in your seat and go, he can't love me that much, really. Because he lifts the boy up off the ground and says, you're gonna stand in a wealthy place. Now that just doesn't mean money. Don't misinterpret that. It means fullness. And what it means is the where you're gonna stand, even when there's just stuff going on, even in that place, there will be richness and fullness for your body, soul, and spirit. You may be on the earth, but you will not be in it. Isn't that amazing? This young fella must have been standing. Why? Because never, Romans 2, 4, never give up on the goodness of God because it's the goodness of God that will lead you to change, to repentance. Can I encourage you this morning, church? Are you feeling blessed this morning? Good. Can I encourage you this morning that this week, the greatest thing that you need is not a breakthrough in this, that, or the other. I've been encouraging my church, I'll actually just read you the verse, uh, over the last number of weeks and months. In, in Matthew 6, in the message, when Jesus is talking about prayer, let me just get it here. I absolutely love the way that he does this. Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just don't, don't pretend. Quit pretending, right? Just be there as simply and as honestly as you can manage, right? The focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense his grace. It's not beautiful. The greatest revelation is not you and what you need. The greatest revelation is Jesus and how he loves you. That's a message for all time. Can you stand with me for a moment? If you can, if you're able, stand to your feet. I wanted to te teach this this morning because I felt the Lord speak to me about it. Not because I, I don't have other things to preach. But I felt that this morning was a morning where chains would break, where hearts would be healed, where brokenness would be mended. And so what I'd ask you to do, if you're comfortable with it, is just to put your hands in front of you and open your hands. It's a posture of humility before the Lord and says, Lord, I'm ready to receive. I'm ready to receive. Many of us have lived for too long under the lie that he loves me to a point, but I gotta get my act together. I should, I should demand, demand, feeling disappointed, never feeling really confident that you can stand on favor ground and believe that your best days are to come. But the Holy Spirit of God, I speak over your people now. I pray a revelation of Abba over you this morning. 
The Lord sees you. The Lord is compassionate over you. The Lord's running to you every day, embracing you, kissing you, and showering you with the Father's love. I pray for fresh hope in people today, that you're not standing dressed in mistake, in failure, standing dressed in righteousness. And I pray particularly into that area where you have believed that it will never be what it was like before, or you will never be able to confidently stand in an area where you failed. Because something in us, that's condemnation, says you kind of deserve what you got. Let me tell you something. The grace of God is bigger than your mess. He's put a ring on your finger this morning and he says, conduct business on my behalf. Where you're weak, I'll be strong. Where you fail, I am strong to deliver. Do not listen to the lie of the enemy anymore that says you have been counted out, that you're not included, that your best days are behind you and not in front of you. The spirit of the living God says of you today, I have called you and your best days for you and your family are still in front of you. So stand in that place today. Stand in that place and put your hands deep into the pockets of righteousness and you'll find whatever you need. So Lord, we receive that word this morning. We receive that grace this morning. We receive that hope this morning. For those who still go, it can't be true. I just pray that this week, grace upon grace will unfold in your heart. I pray for every one of you here that at the point of your weakness and failure, that you would confess your righteousness in that moment and the power of the enemy would be broken over you and your families. Jesus, we love you. I pray today as our focus moves from us to you, we would supernaturally sense your grace. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 We would love to be able to give people an opportunity in this moment to respond to the grace of God, to respond to the fact that the Father loves us. The price of true love is that there is a choice. Otherwise, it's not true love. And God gives us a choice. He gives us an opportunity to be able to respond to His love. And if you've never responded to His love, if you've never heard how much He loves you and had a response that says, Jesus, I believe that you were punished in my place. I believe that you died and took upon yourself the punishment that should have been mine. And I want to say, yes, I believe you did it for me. Then this moment is for you. Every single one of us needs to get to that moment in our lives and be in a place where we say, yes, I trust that your work was for me. And this morning, it would be our greatest privilege if you're here today and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You've never understood how much the Father loves you. You never understood that that's why Jesus went to the cross is so that He could be punished so that you don't have to. That's how much the Father loves you. I'm going to ask for each one of us to be able to come alongside and to pray a prayer that speaks to you receiving the love of God. You see, the Bible says God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God's already made a move towards us. He's already said, I love you. This is a moment that we can respond to that love. The Bible says there's two things that are needed as we respond to Him. First is faith in our heart. And I believe as Pastor Andrew was preaching, faith has been stirring. You can sense it. You can feel it. 
The second thing is to act on that faith and to speak out what you believe. Romans 10 says when you do that, when you have faith in your heart and you speak out that faith, you will be saved. It's a promise. You will be saved. And so here today, we want to give you that opportunity. You can already feel that there's faith in your heart. As a church family, we want to come alongside you and just help you to speak out the faith that will allow you to step into the salvation of God, allow your sins to be forgiven, allow you to have a brand new start with God as your Father who cares for you. So I'm going to ask every head to bow, every eye to be closed. And if you're here in this place this morning, and you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You want your sins forgiven. You want that new opportunity of brand new life. You have faith in your heart. Just speak that out with us as we pray together. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe that you were punished in my place. Thank you. Wash away my sin. Give me a new start and come and live in my heart. Amen. Well, congratulations, because if you've prayed that prayer today, the Bible says all of heaven is rejoicing. You step from death into life and God has given you a brand new start. We would love to be able to give you some material just to point you in the right direction to help you to step into the fullness of that. Uh, we have a new believers table which is in the foyer. You're welcome to stop by there straight after the service and our team would love to make that connection with you. I truly believe we're going to, this morning, part of what God wants to do is for faith to rise in our hearts. And that song that we were singing at the beginning about God can do more than what we think. Pastor Andrew's helped us to understand why that's true. He's helped us to understand that it's the love of God that allows faith to rise in our hearts. And so this morning, what we're going to do is I want to encourage you to stand back to your feet and to be able to sing this with everything that you have in you because I truly believe that as we focus on the love of God, as we focus on the grace of God, we realize that not only is God able, but He is willing. Put your pockets into that robe of righteousness and be able to take out everything that Jesus has died to give you. Let's sing it together.
Father, this morning we put our faith in your love for us. We're so grateful that you love us with an everlasting love. A love that runs towards us. A love that embraces us in our mess. A love that takes away the punishment, the condemnation, the shame. Thank you that as we see you for who we truly are, for who you've made us to be, as we see ourselves in Jesus as righteous, that faith rises in our hearts to know that you are for us and you are not against us. That not only are you able, but God, you are willing. You are a good father who wants the best for his children. So Father, we thank you that as we come to your table of communion, Father, we can come with confidence knowing how much you love us. Knowing what Jesus has done for us. If you don't have any of these communion elements, just raise up your hand and our team will make sure we get, just keep it up high. We'll get that to you because we want everyone to be able to participate with us in this moment. But this is such a practical moment out of the message that we've heard. Because when we see Jesus, when we see his body, when we see him on the cross, it gives us confidence to know that he paid the price. The work is done. So I'm not sure what you are trusting God for this morning. I'm not sure what you're believing God for this morning but see him on the cross, crucified. Take that wafer. Father, we thank you that as we see Jesus on the cross, crucified, his body broken, that there's healing and provision, there's peace, there's everything that we need in this moment. And as we eat of your broken body, we receive the finished work into our lives. Let's participate. You're able to pull back that next layer. It gives you access to the juice speaks of his blood. It speaks of the forgiveness of our sins. It speaks of the righteousness that Jesus died to give us. Be reminded, not only today, but this week, this month, this year, be reminded that you have that robe of righteousness. And within that robe, the pockets, is everything that you need to live out the life that God has called you to. Let's partake. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would truly remind us that as we step into our week, as we step into this month ahead, that we would be reminded of the righteousness that we have in Jesus, of the love of the Father, that the focus is not us, but the focus is Him and what He has done. We thank you for that and all of God's people said, Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today and we trust that you were blessed. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to our page and maybe share this word with someone else. Or even better, join us in person at one of our churches yes. one day. Until then, be blessed.